Hello, good day. Welcome back to Go on the Run. And today we're going to be looking at how to develop code within your Docker container. Apologies for the long time between videos. I expect things to get better soon. I'll share more information on that um, later. A um, couple of things that some of you know, I moved a year ago and I've been sort of living um, in a sort of constrained environment, hence why I can't work on some of my other um, playlists like um, embedded development, for example. Um, I haven't put out any really Flutter videos in a while. And so um, those things I expect to change in and go back to somewhat whatever normal is in a couple of months. Um, we expect to move again. And so maybe after that, um, I'll be able to have the kind of space and so on. Additionally, work has been super crazy and um, in a few months, I expect things to change yet again, and I should be able to have more time and go back to making the videos um, sort of more frequently. Um, before I was trying to post at least one video per playlist per week, and um, I'll try to get back to that. Okay, so that's looking up, and so please bear with me, and we'll get there in a few months. I have a lot of comments on the video saying, Hey, you know, or the channel saying, Hey, we love this material. People find it and they go, I can't believe that though this channel doesn't have uh, more subscribers. But, you know, that is partly me um, because I have to put more videos more frequently. But it's also you, I need your help. So if you really believe and like the material that you see here, I strongly encourage you to help me grow the channel, do your part by ticking the like button check in the notification bell so you can be notified when I post new videos. And of course, making sure that you subscribe. Um, comment if you can on the video so we can get that engagement. All right, like I said, for most of it is probably my fault. I have to put out more videos and probably, you know, put the right set of tags on them to get um, people, make it so that people can find the videos. All right, in terms of today, we're going to wrap up what we're doing with Docker. So today is going to be the last video on the, in the Docker series. And at the end of the video, stay tuned. At the end, I'm going to explain how we move forward and what we're going to be doing next. So you definitely want to stay for the, for the, for the end of this video. Now that we've covered all the outkeeping stuff about subscribing and all that other stuff and me apologizing for the, how frequently I've been getting the video out, um, Let's talk about what we're gonna be covering today. So like I said, we're gonna be talking about how to develop Go code within a Docker, Docker container. And so what it means is basically, can you edit code inside your Docker container? And the answer is yes. And I'm gonna show you three scenarios and there are pros and cons about each, but I'm going to sort of tell you which one I think makes the most sense. So. The first scenario, which I call container store and edit, is probably self-explanatory. You know, within the container, store the code and also edit code within the container. And the th nice thing about this, or the pro, is that you can quickly get up and running with just a start editing some Go code, and you don't have to install any Go tool chains on your computer. It also gives you the ability to try out new features. Let's say there's a new Go version that you want to try out without installing a computer, but just bring up a container and a Go container and you know um, connect to it with your terminal from your computer and into that container. And then you can use like VI or Nano or some terminal editor in that container to edit the code and test it. Okay, so I am here in my Docker, you know, using Docker. Um, section 25 or whatever that is. So now that we have our directory, let's um, get into that directory. And there's nothing in there. And so let me just bring up my VS Code Editor. And so I have some plugin in my VS Code that you may not have. So let's make sure you have that. So if you go here and you click on Extensions, or if you don't have this icon here, which you sh pretty much should do, you can go up to Code here and you should be able to go to this part, preferences, and then extension, and it takes you to the same place. And one of the things that you can look for is Docker. And um, this first one that comes up here, this Microsoft Docker um, thing, you can install that. Now notice there are a bunch of other ones. Um, I do not know 
who those people are and I don't know exactly what those plugins do. And so I, um, I don't install, I haven't installed any of those. The only one I've installed is this Microsoft one. All right. So once you have that install, you're all set. So with that, you should be able to get an icon like this, which is this Docker icon. And so if you click on that, you can see that um, it's showing me a set of containers I have running, these ones in green, and it doesn't matter what I have running, and then some ones in square box with red saying that those are not running, but they previously, they were created certainly, just not running right now. And then some images, these are gonna be all your images that you have in on your system. And this is no different than if you say Docker PS, right? Those are your running container, Docker PS minus A, all. So what you're seeing listed on the containers is really the output of Docker PS minus A because it's showing you what it was running and what is also stuck, all the things that were created. And then your image list here, listing all your images, is going to be Docker image ls command. So these are all the images available on your system. And so, you know, it groups them um, by uh, the repository and then how many things are within them. So, and I'm going to scroll down to go. I think I should have go somewhere here. Yep. And so, let me move this down. You can see I have latest and alpine. Okay, so let's clear this, clear our screen. So uh, let me open back up this also. And let's say that I wanted to run a Docker container for Golang. I can do run. And if you look, you'll see the command it ran was docker run minus r, rm minus d, and then it um, try to run that container. But of course, um, this is going to exit. And so therefore, if you look here, you see, I don't actually have anything because even though it's running with minus D, remember the Docker container doesn't actually have a program that is running. So there's nothing to do with so it exited immediately. Now I could also right click on this and say run interactively. And so you can see the command that is running is Docker RM RM minus IT for interactive and yes, go along that Alpine. I can see I have um, here the terminal it's already entered for the in the into that container for me. So I can just do you know go, go, go things like go version for example. Um, I can do go help and as you can see um, this is a development environment. I have bin, I have source where I can put my source code if I like. So for example if I try to use Vim, uh, the editor, uh, maybe they have VI. Okay, they do have VI. So I'll say VI source main.go and then, um, so VI, right? I'm so accustomed to type in Vim. Uh, VI main.go and then do package main and then let's do import FMT and then function main dot that. And then I can close that and then fmt that print ln and I say hello from Docker container. And I'm going to escape colon w write that out, colon w quit. And so I have my source file there, and this is all within the container. I can say go run. Um, source main and of course that runs but of course if I do exit and so I want you to keep an eye up here I have this Golan container that's running if I do exit of course it's going to go away and so it's gone and so is my source code that I was working on just now so certainly you can bring up a container and do some testing in it Oh, like I said, and so that it was doing some development in the container to be sure, right? I, I wrote the code within the container. Of course, the con or downside to this is that when the container goes away, your code goes away. So not a big problem because we know how to fix this already. We simply have a container in which we map the local directory. And now you don't have to worry that when you connect to that container again with your terminal from your computer, and I treat the container like a remote machine, okay? Um, so you log into it, you can install some editor, and again, you can have the same benefit of testing existing code to see if it breaks or how it works for whatever, right? So that's one way in which you can, what I, what I term, 
host store because the code is stored on the host and container edit. You can still edit the container. And so you still get the benefit, like I mentioned, plus there's sort of like no downside in terms of losing a code. The one downside is that you're using a terminal editor as opposed to your nice VX code or something else like that. So let's say, for example, um, you made some directories and let's say you had a CMD directory, a mod directory for some module A and module B or subsystem or whatever, and um, you want to do some development. So now this is my current directory for my project. And what I can do is I can start a Docker container and mount this directory on our system within the Docker container. So we may say Docker Docker minus run, ah, Docker run minus minus RM and minus interactive. And we want to do minus V for mounting a volume. And so one of the things we can do is in a Unix-like environment, we have a variable called PWD for the current working directory that we're in. And the current working directory is not only just this directory, but the full path of it. So we can do something like this, PWD. And all this is, is the dollar sign just mean environmental variable, um, get the value, and this is the name of the variable. The parentheses, the curly braces around the variable is just in case thing weird character that could be misinterpret. Let me just do this, enter, and let me just show you echo. Um, dollar sign PWD, right? And so you can see that's the whole directory. So that's the directory is going to be used. And so we can go back to this. And so we want to mount the current directory to a directory within the container. So if you remember just now, when I ran this from VS Code, and I say run interactively, I was placing this directory slash go and it had a subdirectory called src. So I would say let's mount it to that directory. Of course, this container is currently running, so um, we'll get back to something like this another time um, later on. But right now, I'm just going to start a container and I want it to go into go source. And the thing image I want to run is go lang alpine. Okay. And so if I run this, now notice interactively, I'm inside that container in the Go directory, but I'm more interested in seeing what's inside of source. And there is um, the source directory as it is on my computer. So let's go here to my files and those two are the same. So what I'll do is I'll run the watch command minus D to show, no, I don't have to need minus D. I'm gonna say cmcat cmd slash main.go. And you can see it can't open main that go because that file does not exist. And so let's create this file. I'll say main that go. I'm not showing you anything we haven't done before because we've seen already. Um, let's see, I'll update tools. Okay, I could do that in the background while I'm still working. Um, so it's doing this thing there. Um, we've seen this before. Oh, we can have files on our file system as we modify them that's exactly what we did we mounted this directory so it makes makes sense that whatever i do on this file on my system will also be reflected in the container it's not being copied it's literally the same file so then i can do um, package that main and so i now i get the benefit of being able to code in my editor and have the code be in the container and I could run it on that version that I may not have access to on my computer. So that's one possible use case. And so then I can do the function, you know, main, that sort of thing, fmt.print line. And then I can say, hello, you know, world, for example, save it and um, da, 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 contain, okay. Oh no, that's part of the whole installation. Um, let's clear that up. Um, now we're really too keen on that anyway. And so let's do import and FMT. So, and save it. And so if you can see, as I save, it shows up over in the container. And so that allows me to still do my development with all my plugin and everything on my computer and write in the code and having it saved locally. But now because it's in the container, I can use whatever version that I create for my container to test the code. So I can still say go run main and um, CMD, go run CMD. I put my code in the, um, the CMD dash of directory. So that's all it is, nothing fancy that we haven't seen before. And so I'll show you a, yet another way. 
So that's where the third scenario comes in. And there are two variations of the third scenario. So scenario number three. So I'm going to cover those. And so the first scenario um, variation here is that you still have a remote container, still map it in. So that doesn't change. But just like how you could run your VS code and have it edit your code locally, and you might be like, well, well, that's all I need to do. I can still connect to the container and compile it and stuff. So why do I need my editor now to connect remotely to the code? Well, it might make a lot of sense, but let's say again, you still have all the benefits of you want to be able to, you know, access a container that's run a different version and all this other stuff. Of course, your VS code can connect locally. But one of the things that VS code has is this thing called VX um, con remote um, container. And it can connect to either remote con um, computer run running SSH or connect to a remote container. So it connect that container, sorry, just connect that container. And when VS code connects that container, it install all the plugins that you have on your host machine, giving you all the benefits of, you know, like you're running it locally. So then you might think, why would I really want to do that if I'm going to have the same set of plugins in the container anyway? So let me show you a variation on this, and then maybe now you can see the benefit. So let's say that at work, you are working on some code and you mapped it into a container, blah, blah, blah. You leave the code at work because you don't want to bring it home. You can move, bring that computer. You don't want to, whatever the reason is, you, you have it running. But at home, you have access to the network and the container through VPN or something. So now you can use your computer at home, fire up VS Code, which is easy. I mean, you can just download it. Maybe you have it installed already. And so now you can use VS Code to connect to that container. And now you have the same ability like locally, you can see and edit those files because VS Code is connecting to that container. It allows you to navigate and use those files as if they're local. It looks like if it's local. And so, but notice, where's this code store? Store it on some other remote computer and you don't care. So I think this last variation of scenario three is probably the most useful and the number of reasons that you might want to use it, either for work situation or maybe if you're traveling and you are using somebody's computer as a guest. So like, for example, my computer, I have a guest account that if somebody wants to use my computer, I wouldn't give them access to my regular account. I give them access to my guest account. In that account, they can do whatever I can clean it up after each person uses it and no problem. So once more, go back here and then do remote. I think it's called remote development. And you can see there's remote containers, definitely install that. There's remote SSH. You can install that if you like to. I did not re install remote Windows subsystem for Linux because I'm not on a Windows system. But if you're on Windows, you might want to install that. Um, the so the in remote development um, extension here essentially include all of the above. That's why I did not install remote extension because then it would install everything else. And like I guess I don't need Windows for workstation. So Windows subsystem for Linux. So that's why I just install individually. Okay. So now once you have remote containers, remote SSH. It's just basically going to allow you to do exactly what remote container is going to do. But let's say you had a computer that you can SSH to. If you don't know what SSH is, just think of it as remote logging into a com another sys computer. So for example, um, if I were to do this and I can SSH into one of my Linux boxes, uh, right, I can SSH into one of my remote Linux boxes. So this is me on my remote machine. And so let's see if that works. And you can see that though, uh, this is a Linux machine. This is not a VM or anything, though it wouldn't really matter, but it's just another machine remotely. So I can use remote SSH to connect to that machine and actually code, um, have my code be stored on that machine and it's not even stored on my computer and I can still use VS Code Editor. So that's actually kind of pretty neat. We're gonna use almost something similar this time, but we don't wanna store a code in the container. We still want to have it the way we have it now where it's mounted into the container. So that's why I'm gonna leave this container running. 
um, because we already mounted our code into it. And what I'm going to do is instead of I'm going to do this, I'm going to use remote container. And what we can do is connect to a remote container. So attach to running container because we already have a running container. And so the running container I want to attach to is this guy, which is the Golang Alpine. I didn't give it a name, so it gave it some random name. And now it connected to that container and it says opening up, blah, blah, blah. Now there's something that VS Code does, which is when you connect a container for remote development, it installs pretty much all the plugins that you have locally, it installs them remotely. So you can see in this remote, this is a remote, this VS Code is connected to that machine remotely. I actually install my plugins over there so I can still have the same set of plugin when I'm developing remotely. It's really pretty cool. Like I said, though, most people are probably not going to need it, but I wanted to show you. But notice how if when you first connect, it doesn't go directly to the directory that you want. You're simply going to go to um, this. When it, um, it connects, it's going to be it's going to ask you to open a folder like there's going to be nothing here. So then you can click open folder and just navigate to where your code is. So that would be like slash go slash source, for example, but or wherever on that container, it's going to automatically connect open in the slash root directory. So you're just going to want to navigate there. But anyway, I'm, I'm actually connected remotely to this container and I, and I really don't need this one anymore. And I can still do the same thing. I can still connect. So now I'm modifying the code in my container using VI, VS code. And so I can still, you know, um, get all the benefit of remote debugging, um, remote editing, and you know, all the plugin goodness of VS Code. So this is another line. And if I save that, and then I go run, you can see there's another line. So the code is there. Now, this is a pretty short video, but I probably made it much longer than it needs to be because of how slow and I repeat stuff, but you guys know this, I tend to want to make sure that you understand what I'm showing. So like I said, this is the last in terms of Docker, but what do we have next? So let me get out of here and let's go up one directory. Well, actually two directories. So let me clear the screen LS. If you look, when we started this going to run series, we started sort of like doing, you know, how do you do JSON encoding, a bunch of different encoding, you know, XML, yada, yada. We moved to and we covered how to use HTTP package, writing a simple web application, doing server sent event. And you could see the whole list of things that we've covered here, right? Um, GRPC, security, we spent quite a bit on security. So um, HTTPS and so on. And then we went into using Go. And so this is the last video on using not using Go, using Docker, sorry. Um, we intend to use Docker, and this is the last video in this section. Now, what we really should be moving on to, based on my plan, and I can always change this, is to move on to doing Kubernetes. Here's the thing, because I'm fairly busy now, and I've not been posting videos as frequently as I like, I don't wanna start the Kubernetes set of um, videos and have them stretch out too long. I like that when I start Kubernetes, I can post a little bit more consistently. And like I said earlier, that in a few months, I, sh I expect that our things are gonna change and I'll be able to get back to posting more consistently. So that is when I'd like to work, get into the Kubernetes. So what will I be doing in the meantime? So instead of posting no videos, what I'll do instead is I'll have some filler videos. These are videos that I've always had ideas or things that I wanted to cover, but because I was sort of doing this series that I never really had a place to put them in. But now would be a good time to sort of do those filler videos. Now, I was wrestling with what should I call the directory? Should it be, you know, 030 or something? And I figured out so what I'll do is I'll just make a directory and I'll call it 001, probably 00, sorry. You know, that's miscellaneous. But I don't even have to call it actually zero zero. I just call it M I S C E L L A N E L U S miscellaneous. And I'll just put um, the filler episodes in there. So, for example, one filler episode that you might expect to see probably next, and now I'm not promising because I could change my mind, it might be, you know, something. Um, 
mkdir is going to be on go um, generics right um, the go community has been working and have a proposal for generics that they've been working through and it's really interesting i've been look i looked at it a few months ago more than a few months ago and i've been meaning to do a video on it to get, try to show you guys what's going on um in the latest go update 1.6 i think it is um things have changed a little bit with um go get and modules and so maybe revisiting instead of going back and doing go modules and adding to this and being confused maybe in this full video um we're we sort of revisit go modules and so i think this miscellaneous directory and the fuller video allow us to sort of revisit um anything that we've sort of covered but we just want to cover again or just new topics that doesn't quite fit into the series yet and i don't know what's going to come after api gateways here and i may mix things up a little bit and switch things around but i think this seems to make sense for the next um like how we should really go about to understand Kubernetes, then do microservices and GWT, JSON Web Tokens, and then API gateways, and then I'll figure out what comes in. I don't think we're gonna run out of things to talk about anytime soon. So anyway, I kind of wanted to mention this whole miscellaneous sort of filler video on the purpose for it, and it's just it's nothing new. I just always wanted to do it, and now it just sort of makes sense given um, how sparsely I've been posting videos that maybe I shouldn't go on to Kubernetes. Um, let me know what you guys think. Um, should I really just wait and do Kubernetes in a couple of months? Um, like I say, um, it's probably gonna be more like in the summer. Um, if you're in the US, that means like, you know, maybe three months from now um, that I'll be able to get into Kubernetes in a consistent way, or at least be able to post more consistently. And so, I sort of feel like if it's better to just wait and just do some of the more fuller videos, um, the other thing here, hot hoc things um, here. All right, so that's it. I'm gonna end it here. Take care wherever you are, stay safe, and see you in the next set of videos. Thanks for your support and your patience. Um, again, remember, you have a role to play in helping me grow this channel too. I know that seems pretty really unfair, but that's about how the YouTube algorithm works. Please subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Like the videos by checking the like button. Hit the notification bell so you can be notified and comment on the video so that shows the engagement. Essentially tell the YouTube algorithm that oh, this is sort of content that's active and you know help it bubble up so that others can see it. So we can have more subscription and you know hopefully get the channel to grow so that that way I am able to post videos more frequently. Okay, thanks again. Take care.